With exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is The Cycling Podcast. Where are we, Lionel? We're not at the Tour de France. The National Theatre on London South Bank, our usual home venue when we're not at races. Not, not quite the same, is it? Bit of an anticlimax, isn't it, really? <laughs> Sorry. But uh, hey, keep listening, folks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's going to get better, honestly. Okay, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hi there. And Lionel Burney. Hello, everyone. And we're back. Back in the saddle after a couple of weeks. Well earned, I think. Or certainly n- much needed is perhaps mm. better for me to say. A much needed break after the, the, the Tour de France, a draining Tour de France, two podcasts a day most days. Mm. It was pretty tiring. How were you after, how, how long did it take you to feel, start to feel normal again, Lionel? Are you, are you still aspiring to that? Uh, still a few weeks away, I think. I came back headlong into some other work. I know hard to believe that there are other things I do other than uh, the cycling podcast, but I do feel a bit better having got back on a, on a bicycle, done a, bit of, done a bit of exercise, cut down on the... Uh, cut down on the number of magnums I was eating during the tour <laughs> so I'm sort of returning to a normal weight again or well, what what equates to a normal weight for me I, facial expressions don't work on podcasts Richard <laughs> normal normal is all relative Daniel are you feeling uh, normal again yeah I've been I've been working as well uh, my Strava times also have suffered slightly the last couple of weeks I wasn't quite not quite in the form I was in before the Tour de France back to the um, home of cycling of course my Loyal companion, Rob Hatch. Who's My loyal companion, I like. Who's, who, who watered the plants and kept the place reasonably tidy while I was away. Great. Well, listen, um, as, as well as re- uh, us recovering and decompressing after the tour, which is necessary, I, I find the first week, it's like you've stepped off a roundabout, and then the, the second week, the tiredness hits you. Um, but, you know, we find something a bit self-pitying here, don't we? Mm. There has been a lot of bike racing going on. Some of these guys barely stop in fact Chris Froome barely stopped at all he was competing in criteriums throughout yeah. Europe Naira Quintana as well I mean he was doing well in those criteriums wasn't he <laughs> yeah he was finishing on the podium most occasions he seemed to be he seems to have been working on his sprinting as well since the um, tour um, he, he I think he won a couple didn't he um, am I mistaken because you know as you've said Rich we, our finger hasn't necessarily been right on the pulse as it usually is but Chris Froome hasn't really milked the whole publicity, post-publicity um, gravy train in the way that, in the same way that he didn't in 2013. Um, he doesn't seem to. I haven't seen him on breakfast TV. I haven't seen him on Richard and Judy, Loose Women, nothing like that. He, he made a he made a fleeting appearance um, in the Sky Sports series. He appeared on Sky Sports on the Monday. Then he just embarked on this tour of you. We should explain for listeners that how the post tour criteriums work there they are essentially exhibition races throughout europe a great sort of post-tour tradition it'd be great to, to go and do them for the podcast in some some year to go around a few of these races and and they are i mean i, I wouldn't i wouldn't say they were fixed but they're not exactly um they're not exactly i would, I would, I would say they're fixed yeah, i mean i'm just wondering how chris Froome's going to pay all these uci fines for re- wearing the tour de france yellow jersey in uh, well, his in appearance fees i would think and his, well, and his prize money yeah they're they're I, I have been to post tour crits in the past when Armstrong was winning the tour and uh, some the, the controversial Lance Armstrong. Yeah, the controversial Lance Armstrong. I can't remember where it was in Belgium. It might have been Alst or it might have been in Holland. I can't remember. I did a couple, but some are uh, they actually charge money for people to stand on the circuit and there was real festival atmosphere there, barbecues and uh, beer being drunk. Um, the racing itself is designed so that the biggest names and the most recognisable stars finish in the first you know few places so you see things like over, over the years Frank Schleck winning sprint finishes against uh, Tor Hushovd or something like that but looking at the top threes and, and all of them and you do see results like first Nairo Quintana second Chris Froome and third Peter Sagan and you think all in the same time you think how on earth did that happen I mean the most ridiculous one of all was that Greg Van Avermaet actually won and didn't fi- finish second in one of them the other day actually we can't that's not really a joke you can use anymore is it since he's won his stage in the Tour de France mm, well he yeah we'll talk about Greg Van Avermaet in a minute I think because uh, the San Sebastian Classic was the first big race after the Tour but Lionel can you give us a little uh, belated roundup of what's happened since the Tour 
Uh, there's been racing here, there and everywhere. Um, pick some of the more important races. The San Sebastian Classic was the first big World Tour race after the Tour de France, won by Adam Yates of Orica Green Edge. A huge victory for him, slightly overshadowed by Greg Van Avermaet's uh, accident on the final climb where a race motorbike knocked him off. Um, that created a big brouhaha with the BMC team threatening to sue or saying they were going to sue for damages for lost publicity Adam Yates came into the finishing straight not knowing whether or not he'd won and then there was a little bit of an unseemly social media spat because quite understandably um, Adam Yates or more to the point his brother Simon took issue with the fact that BMC thought that they'd been denied victory when there was still quite a lot of racing um, to be done at that point uh, what else has happened we've had the Ride London event in London there was the women's uh, race on the Saturday evening won by Barbara Gorishi and the men's classic was won by Jempi Druka Tour of Poland of course another big race uh, I don't know why but lots of hot air balloons land at the finish of those races if you watch the big advertising balloons looks terrible I think on the TV but the race was won by Jon Izagire Sergio Anau of Sky won a stage. Marcel Kittel back to form with a stage win. Tour of Denmark went on as well. Lars Bohm, after his um, illness and the problems with his, uh, uh, what was it, an anomalous cortisol levels um, at the Tour de France, he's back in action, won a stage there. Christopher Yule Jensen gave Denmark a home win there. And then the Tour of Utah won by Joe Dombrowski. And that was probably just as notable for a spectacular crash involving Matt Bramier of MTN Quebec, who uh, crashed into a car on a descent uh, going round a, a, a hairpin bend. And finally, I suppose the big news of the week that isn't transfer-related is that Chris Froome, Tour de France champion, has confirmed that he will line up at the Vuelta later this month. So, Daniel, before we sort of sat down there, you were talking about that how the, the post-tour racing kind of emphasises this, this gulf, this gap between the tour and most other races even world tour races we saw ride london which isn't a world tour race but an incident with a motorcycle marshal i think who believed that set van mark who was the leader at the time was some punter who'd escaped onto the some mammal who'd just um escaped onto the circuit and given quite a violent push um which could have been awful in fact i suspect had he been not a professional bike rider he would have possibly come off and and what would that have achieved it was quite a shocking moment we had obviously the incident at san sebastian with greg van avermaet and actually what a surprising winner he would have been would he not of of san sebastian it's it's a pretty hilly pretty hilly race um but these incidents also the incident with matt bramier do they you have incidents at the tour as well of course but there was something about about them that seemed to emphasize that that difference didn't it daniel yeah, it does. It brings home really a lot of what we talked about, or a lot of what was being talked about. This sort of phony war between Oleg Tinkov and Mark Madio in particular, the Cycles Madovi test, but in a financial sense, two-speed cycling. We spoke about it for years and years in terms of doping, but um, it really is a very sort of staggered system now and staggered financial hierarchy. I mean, I just to be contrary and trying to, trying to be hipster, I watched the Volta Portugal, the Tour of Portugal after the Tour de France. It used to be a fantastic race with great fields and it used to last three weeks, um, 20-odd stages, and now it's down to um, just over a week. And, you know, it's only continental division teams, really, except Caio Rural, and it was really evident there as well, this, um, this great gulf that's opening up. Um, between the haves and have-nots of professional cycling, and you know we're seeing it on a on that level as well, Rich, as you said, with the marshals, people obviously not really being very well briefed about how to do their jobs. Terrible TV coverage, uh, Classica San Sebastian, um, and you know teams closing potentially. Europe Car still haven't got a sponsor um, as we're doing this podcast today. I think the 15th of August is the deadline that Jean-René Bernardo has, has set himself to find uh, an alternative backer um, if not his riders are all going to be free to look for something else and of course this period of the season is characterised really by riders um, fearing for their future, fearing for their contracts not having anything to go to next year and desperately trying to pull out some kind of result uh, just to add a bit of historical context, um, obviously these days the Vuelta a España is held 
late August and into September. That change was in the mid-90s. Um, prior to that, the Vuelta was held in April, May, just after the Classics and before the Giro, sometimes overlap with the Classics. So the race season really changed in the mid-90s, basically 20 years ago. The World Championships used to be held a fortnight after the end of the Tour de France and attracted you know, all of the, all of the best riders in their Tour de France condition. Um, now the World Championships, it's been shunted towards the end of the season. It was kind of at the very end, held in October, too late. But the cycling season now, because of the way the calendar is, it comes out of the Tour de France and there's this sort of vacuum which has been filled by a lot of small races. The Tour of Poland's moved into this gap. The Tour of Denmark has often been held in this slot, but as you know, with TV coverage, I think th- the danger is we see much more cycling on tv now so we're seeing races that in the past we've not have seen even you know something like the tour of utah being on tv lots of clips making their way onto the internet so everyone's seen presumably the matt bramier crash and a a story is created by that but we've got a lot going on but none of it is of a great deal of importance other than as daniel says them for riders who riders and teams who require a result and on the point about san sebastian i mean i sat down and had the afternoon free to watch that and for an hour and a half, they didn't have any pictures because the aeroplane that was supposed to be taking the signal from the motorbikes was not flying for whatever reason. So when Jim Okovic and BMC said that they were robbed of however many hundreds of thousands or millions of euros worth of publicity, really they were robbed by the fact that everyone would have switched off the TV and gone and done something else. It was only because I was working that afternoon that I kept the TV on and, and managed to see Adam Yates win the race. So, I mean... Really, the Tour de France, you go from this massive high, the Tour reaches Paris, and then the cycling season, which has still got two and a bit months left to run, it kind of collapses into a bit of a vacuum, doesn't it? And and we're really just waiting for the Vuelta to start, I suppose. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. Okay, before we crack on with talking about the actual racing, we're going to talk about some of the actual race winners in a few moments. But we have a bit of business uh, left over from Tour de France. It was we ran a competition in the final couple of weeks um, for one old friend and one new friend to win a bundle of swag that was booked by myself, Lionel, and Daniel, and our, the tour is the tour T-shirt. So the competition was for friends of the podcast. As you will all know, you can sign up to become a friend at thecyclingpodcast.com for a measly £5. That will gain you access to uh, our paywall, behind which are eight, I think there are eight now, special friends-only episodes. Um, If you sign up at any point in the year, you can listen to all of those. Three more still to come this year. So our our old friend um, who was picked out, and by old we mean somebody who's been a friend for several months, the winner of that bundle of swag is Liz Miller congratulations Liz a regular correspondent of ours on Facebook and Twitter and the new friend is Andrew McLennan not sure where you are Andrew McLennan but we have your email and we'll drop you a line to tell you that you have won the second bundle of swag so congratulations Liz Miller and Andrew McLennan so let's talk about the the racing Um, Adam Yates obviously I mean it was a couple of notable young winners Adam Yates and San Sebastian and Joe Dombrovsky at the Tour of Utah and I'd also add Miguel uh, Angel Lopez at the Vuelta Burgos yeah okay add him as well, well the, uh, potentially the most promising the most exciting of all of them but we'll get back on to him in a minute okay well I was delighted personally to see Joe Dombrovsky win the Tour of Utah they will talk in the final part of today's podcast about the the event that overshadowed the, that race for Canadiel Garmin which was Tom Danielson's positive test on the eve of the Tour of Utah but Joe Dombrowski is was signed by Team Sky a couple of years ago huge talent from America very geek green, very likeable kid who I met at the Tour of Oman actually in 2013 and um, a very interesting young, young guy who really struggled in his two years with Team Sky had various uh, problems, health problems seemed to miss the states he was based in nice was a little bit lonely there and he moved on to canada garmin at the at the start of the year he had injury problems as well and interest he gave an interesting interview to uh ruler during the the tour de france which published during the tour where he talked about undiagnosed problems um which he put down to sky 
not having doctors who were experienced in cycling, which is which was interesting. Anyway, he's come back this year. He's won the Tour of Utah. He's looked good, and he will ride the Vuelta, and I'll be fascinated to see how he gets on there. Daniel? Like you said, Rich, he was quite green. He did seem quite green. Um, a lot of guys who come over from the States haven't necessarily had that much experience of riding on European-style roads. They ride on very wide roads, as we know, as we saw in, in Utah. And, and really, that doesn't put the same premium on bike handling and racing skills as racing in Europe does but Dombrowski had a glittering amateur career he had a famous duel with Fabio Aru in the Giro della Val d'Osta which is probably as about as mountainous, ra- as mountainous a race as you will see anywhere in amateur or professional racing um, last year I know that um, when he was coming to the end of his contract with Sky he was very close to joining Etics quick step and I know some people who have followed his career um, and, and know Joe very well advised him probably that that probably wasn't a good idea probably not the kind of environment that he would have thrived in and that he was much better suited to Cannondale Garmin and so it has proved and they really desperately needed that result didn't they it's been a tricky season for them it's been a difficult few weeks obviously we're going to talk about Tom Danielson's positive test aren't we we are going to talk about that I mean Dombrovsky is has the certainly the personality I think to really um engage an American audience you know he's clearly got the talent I think we were concerned it might remain unfulfilled Um, it could still remain unfulfilled but he's showing signs of of fulfilling that great potential that he has and and, you know he's a a very uh, sort of open uh, Tour of Oman was his first sort of big big race and he was very open about how in awe he was really of a lot of the riders he was racing against of how difficult he found even just riding in the bunch in a way that a lot of professional riders are not you know they're 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 bluffing a lot of the time but he was very sort of endearingly open uh, and i mentioned there rich what a great amateur he was and there was a bit of an auction actually for don Braski's signature when he turned pro Cannondale were very very keen to have him and back then in that would have been 2013 wouldn't it um and i th- I understand that he was on a, a fairly sizable contract for a Neo Pro because there were so many teams interested. Talking about very promising amateurs or guys who have, have really been talked up in their amateur career, I mentioned earlier Miguel Angel Lopez who won the Vuelta a Burgos. He also won the Tour de l'Avenir last year. Colombian was really outstanding um, in the Vuelta a Burgos. He is known as Superman. Um, because he survived in Colombia in 2010, a mugging attempt, he was stabbed twice in the leg, Um, he got away, I think he fought off um, his attackers, and yeah, won Tour de l'Avenir last year, got picked up by Astana, Um, outstanding climber, is being talked about, a friend of the podcast, Fran Reyes, I know has been speaking to people in Burgos this week, Um, people at Astana have talked about him as being more talented, having more potential even than Nairo Quintana, so there is a name to look out for, and someone who maybe slips under the radar in this um, plethora of racing that there has been since the Tour de France. Well, do we want to talk about any more of that racing, Lionel? Any highlights for you? Any any people you want to pick out? We've not really t- spoken about Adam Yates, who, whose win was overshadowed, but a terrific win. I suppose we're always wondering which of the two Yates brothers would score the first major victory, and it's it's Adam, but you suspect that Simon might not be too far behind. No, but it was a very good um, win. He took his... Well, I mean, it's difficult to know exactly we what he did. We didn't see it. <laughs> well... I, we could have jumped out of a bush for all we know, couldn't we? Well, we saw we saw um, we saw him we away. Saw him yeah, we yeah. saw him. At, we saw him when he went away from the from the other group of, of riders. And uh, um, you know, the thing about San Sebastian is it is it's always riders who've come out of the tour in very good form. When you look at the group behind, it was Valverde, Balca Molima, um, other people who uh, well, Van Avermaet had won a stage, hadn't he? So he was up there, really sort of. Um, used his Tour de France form to very good effect um, and yeah, probably the first of many wins for the pair of them I would have thought Transfer gossip, we need a jingle for transfer gossip P- some people don't like the, the transfer gossip, we've had a few requests for 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 more transfer gossip, but we can actually bring transfer news as well as just gossip Come on what? Well, well I'm, I, what transfer, transfer news just leaves me cold really, I went to sign the contract join the team in January and let, let's let get on with it because they're all the speculation about who might go real, here where real civil servants perspective <laughs> from Lionel 
wouldn't expect anything else. Right, Lionel, you sit on the bench for this. Yeah. Um, Daniel, right, so, so <laughs> Mark, Mark right, so as, 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 as exclusively revealed by the podcast in our preview, just slipped in there in our, in our Tour de France preview, Richie Port has joined BMC. Well, I, think, I think we were the first to reveal that, yeah. uh, having, having a few weeks earlier <laughs> revealed that he would be staying at Sky. Um, Mark Cavendish, what's the latest on Mark Cavendish? I'm hearing MTN Quebec. I think they're very much in pole position, but I think there's a lot of uh, pieces that still need to fall into that particular jigsaw, you know, maybe other riders, etc. Um, going with him to MTN, I think that um, nothing is imminent, imminent at this very moment. Um, I think it will probably be the end of August before we have an answer on where he's going to go. But I think the the ethics link or the, his connection with ethics is perhaps getting colder and colder and it's m- becoming more and more like he's going to move. Lionel, what are you going to say? Just in summary then, we don't know. No, we don't know. <laughs> no, we don't know. We don't know. But, you know, I'm looking at my phone but and well, there could be news as we're speaking. I'm assuming though Mark Cavendish will still be a professional cyclist next season. Yeah, yeah. So that's an exclusive for us. <laughs> <laughs> Any right? So we, Mikel Landa's going to Team Sky. We know that he's riding the Vuelta for Astana. Um, anything else? Mikel Kwiatkowski still going to Sky? Well, just on the Yates as well. A couple of confirmed deals, like which Lionel, you can weigh in on these. Um, the Yates, the Yates twins are obviously a more and more prominent part of that team's plans. Arica Green Edge. They've signed up a couple of domestiques who are going to. I'm sure be helping the Yates twins next year. Amit Churuka, the Basque rider, and Neil Stevens, I think one of the direct sportives, Arika Green Edge was very keen to get him on board and brokered that deal. I think he's been riding for Kaya Rural this year. Churuka. And uh, Chris Yul Jensen, the is he the Irish, Danish, I don't know. Is he more Irish than Dan Martin? More Irish than Stephen Roach? Than Nicholas Roach? I don't know. Nicholas I mean. Roach is definitely more is French than Irish. Irish. We we over I don't know if I said this. Is there any rider in the press? This is a very controversial one, but is there anyone in the pro peloton who is fully 100% Irish with an Irish accent? No kind of. Um, I was going to say Sam Bennett, but he was he was born in Belgium, wasn't he? Sam Bennett. There's uh, there's Matt Bramier, there's Dan Martin. They're all if they ride for Ireland, Daniel, they're <laughs> fully Irish. All right. Um, we should mention that a uh, friend of the podcast and Scotsman Teo Gagan Hart. He is Scottish. He rides for Scotland. He represents Scotland. He's he's as Scottish as Andy Fenn and David Miller. Um, so anyway, Teo Teo Kagan Hart and Alex Peters have been signed as stagiaires for Team Sky at the end. I'm not quite sure yet when Teo will make his debut in Team Sky Colours. Do you know, Daniel? No, but Alex Peters has got a contract for next year as well with Team Sky. So he's turning pro. Yeah, and it's a bit unsure about Teo's status, whether he will be signed. I asked Rod Ellingworth about that last week, and the answer was a little bit vague, so I'm not sure. We um, must uh, contact Teo and ask him. That would probably be the simplest thing, wouldn't it? Any other transfer in Houston? Well, I'm waiting for a call from um, Pippo, P- Pippo Pozzato's agent, um, because there were reports last week in Het News, but which I think might have been taken from stuff we said in the podcast suggesting that Podsado would definitely sign for Tinkoff Saxo. I don't think that's a done deal yet by any means. It's a possibility but, you know, Pippo could end up he could end up at Team Sky, who knows? No, I don't think he would end up at Team Sky. Are you saying one of our rumours has made its way into um, the mainstream media as, as a sort of that's solidifying a, fact but may not be that's a frequent occurrence now Lionel we're that influential let's try and plant a few more <laughs> shall we um, ok let, let's let, let, I, but on the subject of sta- stagiaires the we, I was you, I mentioned the, the two su- signed by Team Sky Tail Gig and Hart Alex Peters quite unusual Team Sky haven't had many stagiaires which is basically trainees in, in the past and I wonder because these are two young British talents whether the example of the Yates brothers joining Orica Green Edge has served as a sort of cautionary tale. Well, I was about to use that phrase, cautionary tale. From the rider's point of view, we mentioned Don Browski earlier. There have been other examples, and there have been pundits and experts and, and also fans who have suggested that it would be a very bad idea now for young riders, promising young riders, to join Team Sky for the you know the issues we've spoken about in the past they're not the best team and by their own admission they, they haven't been the best team at developing young riders Don Brusk is a good example so um, it'd be interesting I'm sure we'll find out from the Scotsman that well-known Scotsman Teo Gagan Hart um, yeah, well, if we can understand yeah. his thick Scottish <laughs> Glasgow accent but 
Team Sky have, I think, successfully developed a couple of different types of rider. Luke Rowe and Ian Boswell, who joined Team Sky with uh, with Joe Dombrowski. I saw a tweet from Ian Boswell on his way, I think, to the Tour of Poland, saying that he was looking forward to listening to the cycling podcast because, and I quote, it sends him to sleep. So that's nice. But Boswell has, has developed in a way that Luke Rowe also developed as a sort of as a team man, as rather than somebody seeking his own opportunities, and and he's he's developed he's developed quite nicely. Yeah, and we talked about the huge number of races that there are at this time of the season. Often, seemingly, well, not I wouldn't say meaningless races, but um, races that the public that don't really necessarily resonate with the public. However, there are some great opportunities here to blood new blood is not a a verb that we ever like to use in professional cycling, but to give young riders uh, an opportunity to lead teams, isn't it? I mean, you know, races like the Arctic race, which is coming next week. Um, we mentioned Burgos, we mentioned Poland. Um, the, I'm sure we'll see some young riders really get some good experience of leading teams in the next few weeks and really emerge and state their claim for a, a bigger role next year. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast and British Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you once again to British Eurosport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. Coming up on the Home of Cycling from the 9th to the 16th of August, so going on at the moment, is the Eneco Tour broadcast live from the 13th to the 16th of August. Also live is the Arctic Race of Norway. And from the 17th to the 23rd of August, also live is the USA Pro Challenge. And then, of course, we're into the Vuelta a España. There are also highlights of various other events coming up, including the Women's World Cup and the Tour Series. Now, I took part in an event last week with Rod Ellingworth, the performance manager at Team Sky, and Dr. Richard Usher, Team Sky's head of medical practice at the Rafa Cycle Club in Manchester. It was to coincide with the launch of a new exhibition, uh, Tour du Courage, which features photographs from this year's Tour de France, some taken by professional photographers, some submitted to Rafa under the hashtag Courage Cycliste, all from this year's tour. I took part, I hosted a a conversation, I suppose, with Rod Ellingworth and Richard Usher, in which they gave us an insight into what happened at this year's tour from a Team Sky point of view. It was fascinating. Rod Ellingworth was as straight talking as he always is. And there were some great audience questions as well. This will be going out as a podcast, just a little extra um, free to everybody to listen to in the next couple of days. So listen out or watch out for that special podcast and thank you very much to Rafa Cycle Club in Manchester and to Rafa for organising the event. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for the Cycling Podcast. Okay, another little bit of business before we talk about Tom Danielson and his positive test. You can hear Jonathan Vauters in our park, our, which is one of our Friends specials, um, which was released during the Tour de France. I mentioned earlier the Friends scheme, and we should say a huge thank you to everybody A, who listened to our podcast during the Tour de France. I think we had 1.8 million listens over the course of the tour, and we've been really blown away by the, the feedback that we've had since the tour. Lots of really nice comments, uh, and we really even if we've not responded to all of them, we have certainly read them all and appreciate all the tweets, uh, Facebook messages and emails. Thank you very much indeed. It really it really helped us, I think, get over the sort of post-tour blues. So thank you very much for that. So cracking on, fellas, with the, the week's news. Tom Danielson, I mentioned, uh, Tour Utah began under a cloud with the defending champion, Tom Danielson, having tested positive for testosterone. Danielson, of course, is part of the, the clean team, Cannondale Garmin, uh, which really since 2008 has had cleanliness, if that's the right word, ethical cycling at, at, the, at their core. This has been this is their first positive test. It's a, it's a second offence for Danielson. It's, not, it's more than a second offence, but he's already served a, a, a six-month suspension for admitting to doping as part of USADA's investigation into Lance Armstrong. So if the this offence is confirmed and at the moment we're waiting for the B sample to be analysed it will be a lifetime ban for Tom Danielson who's 37, it'll be the end of his career obviously, a lifetime ban generally is Um, but a shock, are we shocked? Um, It was always the understanding from Jonathan Vauters that if a positive test occurred the team would fold Uh, that's not going to happen it's slightly more complicated than when he made that comment originally because Cannondale have come in as a sort of part owner of the team 
so I don't think we're that surprised that the team will carry on. Um, but Lionel, were you? What was your reaction t- to the news? Well, I mean, I suppose surprised because of um, the uh, way that Jonathan Vorters has always made it very clear that anything that's on the banned list is completely off limits. Uh, you know, that's the whole the whole genesis of the team was that it came out of uh, as Slipstream Sports was founded as a um, as a as a, a route for the riders to come through uh, without being in, expected by anyone in the team organisation or encouraged or enabled by anyone in the team organisation to use any banned substances whatsoever that's the whole foundations that the team is built on and of course we've covered this in the past you know the 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 kind of gray area with slipstreams policy which is that they will hire people who have had a doping past as long as they are open and frank and honest about that within the four walls of the team organization so jonathan waters would quite uh, would would hire a, a an ex-doper on the basis that they admit to him what they had done in the past and that they commit fully to a, a 100% clean way of trace, training and racing. Um, Tom Danielson obviously is surprised by this result, doesn't know how it comes to, has come about, um, says that he is innocent of doping, has requested the B sample, so we can't prejudice things until we know the result of that. Um, but it did strike me that you know testosterone was one of the substances that featured quite heavily in that USADA report. I think one of the more evocative images from not only that report but also Tyler Hamilton's book was how testosterone was taken as a liquid in olive oil and, and just basically spooned into the mouth. Um, so w- I think we have to wait and see. Uh, the It would be a surprising one if a team was sunk by, you know, one positive test for testosterone um, you know again it's a, a presuming it's exogenous testosterone so not testosterone uh, an elevated natural it's, it's, level. it's not an elevated natural level it's the CIR test carbon isotope ratio testing which has so it's synthetic testosterone there has actually been a case of a of a positive test for testosterone effectively sinking a team Patrick Sinkovitz was the final straw for T-Mobile it's not a substance that ends up in your body I was going to say by mistake. Of course, it it can be my mistake if it's in a supplement or something. And he has said that he will have his supplements tested. But you would have thought that a team like Garmin would keep a very, very close eye on, or try to keep a close eye on any supplements the riders are taking. Yeah, you would. And with the carbon isotope testing, which has changed, well, it's been more used more frequently now, that type of test. It's a much more sophisticated test than the old and testosterone epitestosterone test so if there are trace levels of synthetic testosterone they in theory can be picked up and trace levels of course you know, could in theory come from a a supplement which presumably might be tom danielson's um alibi but it just underlines the the whole issue of vigilance you know we garmin or cannondale garmin have always had this the slipstream organization has always had this reputation it's always had this USP unique selling point of um, being very transparent and really being hot on that topic of anti-doping um, but the, there is only so much you can ram home the message isn't there is it? and particularly you know I talked earlier about the, the racing at this time of the year what comes after the Tour de France all these riders who are effectively and this really shouldn't be the case with Tom Danielson because he's already had his career and you would think he'd be thinking about retirement at this point of the year but um, even for a guy like him and then we had the case of Fabio Tabore the second Androni rider and that team's now been um, effectively banned for the next month by UCI but um, these riders who don't have a contract next year their livelihood is at stake they, they're they desperate for I don't know is it one last shot of the title one last shot of the jackpot and I think it's a, it's a very vulnerable time of the year um, and teams have to be extra extra vigilant but also a lot of it has to be done on good faith and they're just crossing their fingers and they're just hoping that no one does something stupid because you know the testosterone testing has been very fallible for a long time you know you only have to read Floyd Landis's book and Floyd Landis what he said about 
and why he took testosterone in 2006 at the Tour de France. He was sure that he could get through those loopholes and even after 2006, someone like Floyd Lannis would have told you you could still find ways around the testosterone, epitestosterone test. Um, so, you know, there are, there are still guys who, who think that they can do this stuff and, and get away with it. There's no real risk. So um, it, it's very dangerous. I, I spoke to Victor Conti, you know, a few months ago um, about this. Obviously, he was at the centre of the Balco scandal uh, wh- where he developed a, a secret steroid, which was testosterone-based, as all anabolic steroids are. And at the time, since the, the substance wasn't known by the authorities, they, they could get away with it. It was called the clear and he said, you know, this was one encouraging thing. He said that that loophole has been closed now with the CIR testing. It means that um, if if they use CIR testing, then they will catch somebody using a testosterone-based product. We don't know yet the amount of testosterone, whether it has been in a in a supplement of some kind. Um, w- you know, when you hear that it's been subject to CIR testing, you think, well, maybe it was targeted because it is an expensive test. Kaylee Fretz uh, of Velonews has done a, a piece this week about it, saying that actually USADA are using it quite a lot more than they, they used to. So perhaps it's not targeted. Um, but but you do you do wonder, you know, if that's the case. I guess we'll, we'll find out. Um, it, it's particularly galling, I think, in the case of a rider like Danielson at the stage of his career that he's at, the, the team that he rides for. If this is a case of doping, then it's a, a huge abuse of, of trust, I think. Um, he complained about, you know, after all he's gone through, um, you, you know, for him to contemplate doping would be would be ridiculous. But I, you know, what some of the 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 um, witness testimonies in the USADA reason decision were quite um, upsetting. David Zabritsky, people like that. Um, Tom Danielson, it seems to me that he chose to dope for a few years. He had some decent results. He rode for some really good teams. Earned a lot of money. Then he confessed all and got a six-month ban in the off-season, pretty much. And also, let's not forget, Tom Danielson was never caught for doping until last week. So, you know, however contrite he appeared to be, um, he'd never been caught in an anti-doping test. So if he doped successfully for years and years and years, then um, this the, the latest developments in testing and this, the introduction or the increase in the use of this um, carbon isotope test notwithstanding... Um, he could have carried on doing exactly what he'd been doing for years and years and years and just um, got unlucky or not been aware that the testing had changed slightly and, and you know, been caught for that reason. We don't know. We don't know, of course. Lionel? Well, I was just thinking, you know, the, the team's policy of uh, one test, one positive test and out, um, and I'm just weighing up in my mind whether that's productive or counterproductive for the anti-doping effort. Um, it, would, it strikes me, on the one hand, it sends a very strong message, you know, but on the other hand, if if that would then be Garmin, Cannondale or Cannondale, Garmin, sorry, disappeared, all the riders out of a job who wouldn't have had anything to, you know, assume, we assume would, would not have had any knowledge of any of this, the staff as well. And teams that don't have as stringent um, a, a hiring policy and uh, as, as a strong an adherence to kind of internal um, uh, anti-doping policies you know carry on and it also struck me that if this had been another high profile team at Astana or Sky or one of the other teams that attracts a lot more criticism there would have been a much stronger backlash and I think Cannondale Garmin have actually got away pretty lightly with with any um, negative publicity around this well and, and Jonathan Vorters the the manager of, of Gan. Um, Gannadel Carmen, let's go back to the name we use throughout the Tour de France. Um, he has been lauded and praised for the how realistic he's been, and he's been very much against Sky's policy, the so-called zero, zero tolerance policy of not hiring anyone who's had any connection with doping in the past. So, on the one hand, he's seen very r- realistic. So, but then on the other hand, to say, oh well, you know, if there's ever a positive test, when let's face it, there's an, he can't necessarily control that. He doesn't know exactly what his riders are doing. That doesn't seem very realistic at all, does it? And it doesn't seem consistent with um, his general kind of fairly pragmatic outlook. No, it doesn't. But let's not forget, Jonathan Waters has used this thing of look, we are at the sort of forefront of all of this. Um, this is how we're going to live. We are on the on the cusp if we have a positive test we will disappear that had been quite a a strong point in his entire anti-doping policy that 
that they weren't going to mess about, that one positive test would sink them. And he, it's a little bit like the rider Hazidal situation where he was aware that Hazidal had doped earlier in his career but allowed the world to think that Hazidal's Giro d'Italia victory was a triumph for a spotlessly clean cycling. Now, you know, we can only assume Hazidal was clean when he won the Giro uh, for the Garmin team, but internally people knew that he had doped in the past and that only came out with the USADA report and so there was a little bit of banking the PR first and then mm. you know allowing a kind of so in, it's a similar thing Jonathan Vortes has banked the PR of saying that we will disappear if we have a positive test but now that they've had a positive test he said oh well we're not going to do that well we we've challenged him on this of course a couple of years ago when we discussed the Hesidal Hesidal it didn't come out actually in USADA report it was later on in the in the investigation linked to the Michael Rasmussen but yeah, and we should say that, that obviously Danielson hasn't, uh, the, the, the positive test hasn't been confirmed yet. Shall we wrap it up there? I'm sure we'll return to this and lots of other topics in future weeks. Uh, just a final word on the friend scheme. A lot of people asking about mobile downloads. Uh, we are working on that. Um, we've been building the technology this year. We needed the, the money in first before we could really do that. Um, so thank you very much for all those who've signed up as friends. It's allowed us to build a paywall. We're now working on mobile downloads, and we hope to have uh, some good news on that very soon. Uh, so thanks for your patience. Also, a little reminder that you can buy Cycling Podcast T-shirts at our website, thecyclingpodcast.com. And Daniel, you sent me an email here with news of a special offer, free socks, this weekend. With If you... Um, use the code Socky in the basket. I think Socky, S O C K Y, in uh, in your order. Cracking socks. Belting socks. They are absolutely cracking. They seem to be called bamboo socks. Is that correct? Yeah. Free with free free with every t-shirt. A pair of bamboo socks, whatever they are. So get your orders in. Lots of uh, lots of funny and otherwise slogans available in our shop on thecyclingpodcast.com. That's all for this week. I think. Thank you very much, Daniel. No worries. Uh, And we'll see you next week. And thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pear for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.